Emulation is such a polarizing topic to cover. Many people like me embrace it, but others don't, calling it a gateway to piracy and illegal ROMs. Now, whatever your stance, emulation only helps in the fight of video game preservation and its importance only continues to grow. Many platform holders and publishers license popular emulators for their games and some of them build their own. Now, we've covered many generations of console emulation, but one we haven't really focused on is the last generation. In other words, I mean the Sony PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One, because these systems are still relatively new, certainly not capable of playing commercially developed games. But that is until recently with the release of Spine, a PlayStation 4 emulator for the PC that was just released to the public. Now, while still very early in its infancy, it can indeed boot and play some PlayStation 4 commercial games. Now, while you shouldn't expect Ghost of Tsushima or Bloodborne anytime soon, this is a massive step forward for PS4 emulation and it will continue to grow and advance from here on out. And let me tell you, it's got me pretty excited. Now, before we jump into Spine and show you how all that works and get it all set up, I wanted to mention that if you Google PS4 emulation, and I just did this just before, the first hit that you'll get is a website known as PCSX4. This looks legitimate. And if you remember, PCSX is a popular PlayStation 1 emulator. Now, PCSX4 even has a GitHub link and everything looks official like this is a legit emulator. Now, I want to be very clear, this is all fake. Do not click on that download link for this because honestly, who knows what you're downloading. But I just felt like it's my duty to tell you and let everyone know that you should not download PCSX4. It's simply not real. I'm not really sure the purpose of this but there is no way PS4 emulation is this far advanced where first party Sony titles are running flawlessly under emulation on a PC. It's just not real. But let's go back to Spine and talk about that. So it's the work of an anonymous developer known as Spine Dev, and it's been in development for quite a few years. In fact, going back to 2019, it was booting into commercial games. So the progress that we're going to see today isn't necessarily new, it's just that Spine Dev, as he's known, has finally released his emulator to the public and released a compatibility sheet that really illustrates what's actually playable. Now, back in 2019, Spine Dev released a YouTube video showing some of the progress and it was booting and running games like the Mega Man Legacy Collection and Stardew Valley. Pretty simple 2D works, but it was a pretty good start. So then why am I bringing up Spine today? Well, the public update was just released that included that compatibility list that I mentioned, and it's sitting at around 50 or so titles that you can get in game and are considered somewhat playable, and many others that you can boot into the intro screen before they crash. And there are some YouTube videos that are already out there showing gameplay of the potential and what you can actually see with this. But as always, I wanted to set this up for myself and take a look. Now, the results are quite primitive, but they are very promising. And you should keep this in mind that this is very much a work in progress and you should definitely not expect anything AAA to run. Right now, it's limited pretty much to mostly 2D indie games and they seem to run pretty well for the most part. The emulator comes with that compatibility guide, as I mentioned, and it's just an Excel spreadsheet. And if you look through this list, you'll basically get an idea of what's playable. And again, most of these games tend to be 2D indie-based games, but there are a couple of AAA games that are considered in-game here. And I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at one of these AAA games and see if it actually works for us. Now, setting up Spine, is pretty complicated. And one thing that I have to mention to you guys that it runs exclusively under Linux. There is no Windows executable for this. And honestly, I'm not sure if there ever will be one. So what I ended up doing was installing a Linux distribution on an external SSD. And I'm gonna connect it up to my laptop here that's running an NVIDIA 2060 and has an Intel i7 processor. Now, as mentioned, there is no Windows build and you have to use Linux. And if you decide that you want to use a virtual machine, 
then you need to make sure that your GPU pass-through is active. Otherwise, I don't think this emulator will work. For me, I didn't want to mess with VMs. I tried VMware, but I didn't get very far getting the GPU pass-through working properly. So in the end, I just installed a native Linux onto my external SSD and plugged it into my laptop, and that works totally fine. Now, once you've set up Linux and downloaded Spine, simply extract it to a folder, and this is the complicated part you'll need to pull PlayStation 4 firmware files. Now, the problem is you can't just download a PS4 firmware update file like you could with RPCS3. So you'll need to access a hacked or modified PS4 to pull down decrypted firmware data off of that hacked PS4 and then copy it into your firmware folder on Spine. And now you should all be set up to run this emulator. But of course, you still need some games. So how do you get games over? Well, I took a look at the compatibility list and I took a look at all the games that I've purchased over the years for the PS4. And once again, you can't just transfer over PS4 package files that you download or anything. They need to be installed on a hacked PS4 and the contents of that package is what Spine is expecting. In other words, and eboot.bin is the executable that it's looking for to launch the game. So what I ended up doing was installing packages onto my hacked PS4 of games that I own and then FTPing all that data off of my PlayStation 4 and then copying it onto a flash drive and then onto my Linux device. Pretty complicated, a lot of steps you got to get, you know, to get your games on Linux on Spine. And there's probably an easier way that someone's going to tell me that I could have done, but that's the way it worked for me. But in any case, once you have a couple of games set up, now it's really a case of launching into the game. Now, this is not very user-friendly, but it's not meant to be. This emulator is very early in development. There's no GUI or there's no UI, and there is a lot of hoops that you have to jump through. Now, if you don't have access to a modded PS4, then you may not get very far. So let's test some games. Now, what games did I test and how do they perform? Well, the first game that I tried was Dead Cells. And I gotta say, this was a great first impression because it loaded really fast into the title screen and the game itself is quite playable, but of course you'll note the graphical issues that are present. The speed and performance running on my three-year-old laptop is very impressive, and not to mention the sound emulation is really excellent. Now you can tell that this emulator has a ton of care and attention put into it. And again, this is a pretty good start. Now, I also tried Sonic Mania. Now, I saw a video of Sonic Mania running and it looked excellent running at full speed, albeit with color palette issues. And when I tried it, I had the same color palette issues, of course, but I couldn't get over how fast the emulation is running in this instance. With a few fixes, Sonic Mania could be near perfect. Now, of course, the game is not going to tax the CPU or GPU, but it's a great early look at the emulation and its future potential. Now, the next thing that I tried was to up the ante and look at a AAA game on that list, and one of them was Dark Souls Remastered. Now, surely this game is not going to run. I'm not really sure why it would say in-game, but it was on the list anyway. So much to my surprise, when I tried out Dark Souls Remastered, it loaded into the title screen, and it allowed me to enter the menu and create a character, and it even loads into the intro sequence, which I think is just video files or Bing files. It has to be. I don't think this is real-time 3D. And at the end of the intro sequence, it actually got in-game. And as you can see, the emulation has not locked up. You can still press your button inputs. Now, I want to tell you that Spine is currently closed source, and it may always be closed source. This is the author's wishes, which I totally respect. They don't want forks of the emulator appearing and diluting the work that's being done. But at the same time, personally, I'd love to get a close look at this thing and see how it all works. Maybe we will get a write-up document on how it's all been architected. The PlayStation 4, although is an x86-based game console, has quite a bit of complexity associated with it. For example, there are two pools of memory in the PS4 architecture known as garlic and onion. I know they're weird and interesting names, but that's what they're called. And emulating those memory pools sounds extremely complicated to me, and I'd love to learn more about how that all works. The other thing is the PS4 doesn't use OpenGL, Vulkan, or DirectX. It has its own proprietary graphics API known as GNM. Now, Spine appears to be using OpenGL as its renderer, so even this would be a challenge to overcome. How 
does the OpenGL to GNM kind of layer work? How does that map across? Am I even thinking about this in the right way? And I'm also curious about shaders, how they were managed as well. But in any case, let's kind of move on. Now, looking at the R emulation subreddit, SpineDev is actually quite active on there and mentions that updates should be more frequent as there are significant improvements made, which is kind of cool. I mean, there's no reason just to you know, release an update next week to fix a couple of minor things. I mean, I think the goal of this is anytime there is a breakthrough in the emulation, they will report or release an update to the emulator, which is awesome. Now, when he was asked about the roadmap, he responded that there wasn't a roadmap and um, he was quoted as saying, there are multiple things that can be worked on and I switch between to not get bored. I don't know what the future will bring, but it tends to get better with time. And for me, they definitely have the right approach here. And anytime we'll see a significant update to the emulation, I'll be sure to make a follow-up video. But this is exciting times for PlayStation 4 emulation. This is definitely a milestone and a breakthrough, and I'm looking forward to what's next. It also will motivate other teams that are working on PS4 emulation to perhaps improve and perhaps help each other out. And that can only be a good thing for the community. But at the end of the day, I want to stress, again, you're not going to be playing Bloodborne on your PC anytime soon. While this is a great milestone to hit, there is a lot of work to be done. And PS4s that have, you know, the C-bomb issue, something that Sony refuses to acknowledge, this emulation may end up becoming extremely important in the future, just in the same way that RPCS3 is becoming a very popular and a very important emulator for PlayStation 3. But we are going to leave it here for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to put a like on it, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.